A lot of time has passed, and in that time, several sessions have been played, and a lot has been accomplished, so it's time for another recap in our ongoing Edge of the Empire campaign. <laughs> There's been a lot of pressure recently from the players for me to get this recap done. I'm not sure if that's because the memory is fading uh, of what it is that we've accomplished, or so much time is passing in between each session that they're, that they're worried about forgetting important stuff, or if they just like hearing me talk about the stuff that they've done. Maybe it's all of the above. Well, since the last recap, an awful lot of stuff has taken place, and a lot of it has been pretty cool. So uh, I'm happy to talk about it. Now, at the end of recap 11, the characters had taken themselves back to Tatooine. They'd received a message from... Nemesis is not the right word. They'd see... They received... A taunting message from a long-term pain in the ass <laughs> who are now two of them who are now working together that's Rin Valiant kind of a, a rival to Captain Highwind and Wreck who is the the counterpart to our Bothan scout character Moss there's something wrong with Rex wiring. He's that guy who just can't get the hint. The group has defeated him, uh, foiled his plans again and again, shown mercy, let him go. And yet he keeps coming back. He keeps agreeing to uh, embroil the group in, in more ridiculous schemes and scams. And uh, he keeps turning them in to people. So... Patience has really worn thin, but these two characters, this Rin Valiant uh, competitor character and Wreck, this betrayer, they have combined forces and they have not only hijacked the large freighter that the last few months have been about reclaiming. As soon as it was reclaimed, these two stole it. The crew had no real idea how these two managed to pull off the theft. They would need a very large crew of people. It's a massive, massive ship. And, you know, how they, how they got the timing right. But even though that part of this plot eluded them, they were very quickly able to figure out how they could, one more time, turn the tables on these two. And just to take a second, these two rivals of, of the group... Like I said before, I can't really call them nemeses because they don't have that that feel to them. These are characters that we often like to make fun of. They are successful in what they under, undertake. You know, they're successful smugglers and uh, successful con artists and, and things like that. But their their vision of their criminal future is often confused or. Uh, they are often distracted by their desire for revenge or to one-up Captain Paul Highwind and his crew. Wreck clearly wants to defeat Moss, not just kill him or just, you know, skip ahead making a, uh, making a few bucks on these manipulations or these betrayals, but he wants to win. He wants to show that... He's superior. And of course, the rivalry between Highwind and Valiant is the same sort of thing. Valiant was a very successful smuggler, and he sort of filled the void that Han Solo left when he vanished, ferrying two nondescript ruffians from the from the Dune Sea uh, offworld. But Highwind also fills that void. And... You know, on the surface, Rin is the more successful businessman, but yet it's Captain Paul Highwind that Jabba would prefer to deal with when he has to deal with these two. So they're not sure how it was that these two managed to do what they did, but they are able to figure out why they did it and how they, they intend it to end. And so that lets them get in there and and disrupt the plans because the one thing they have really to their advantage right now is that the ship that was stolen is so very very slow and they know where it's going so they will be able to arrive in Tatooine before the villains do now 
one part of this that causes them concern is that in stealing the ship and hijacking the ship, they also managed to kidnap its crew, which includes Lynn Delmar. And Lynn Delmar, we've talked about in other recaps, she's an incredibly important part of the NPC crew. And she and Henry have sort of implicit relationship. We don't really talk too much about how significant they are to each other romantically, but it's an understood thing. It's also a sort, a small source of humor in the group as uh, Captain Paul Highland often makes some kind of, of joke about, you know, why did she fall for him? You know, kind of thing. You know, I, I was right here the whole time. And it's not just her. It's not just this very important part of the, the NPC crew that we're worried about. Also, they're all of the street kids that were smuggled away. Oh, we're going to take you to a, a nice, safe place away from all this war. So as the, the Eight Day Rebellion was breaking out on Briss 2, our heroes are smuggling away these street kids who've been hounded by the Imperial operatives and, and whatnot to a brand new life. Well, their brand new life starts out with being kidnapped <laughs> in this hijacking of this ship. So motivation is high to recover the ship one more time and to to free the hostages okay so that means beating the freighter to tatooine easy that means going in having an audience with jabba and getting him to play along uh, not lifting the bounties but at the same time not actively hunting them down either and preventing them from finding his rival miata who they need to get into the good graces of so that they can you know, get close to Rin and Rick when they arrive, or at least find out their schedule or, or where they're going to, to put this freighter while they're, they're running their scam. So that was not very easy, but they managed to do that. And at the end of the last recap, the group had figured out there was a rebel cell operating in that area. And you know, with some of them already developing ties to the rebellion they wanted to make contact and that's how we ended well we open up with meeting the rebels and they were right this was a like a resource acquisition and storage cell that's what they do they have this underground uh, storehouse of, of not really military but important to the rebellion materiel that, that they have stored and of course Jabba has his hands on most of the smugglers and Miata has them, has the others. So the, the rebels aren't terribly fond of either one. They don't like having to deal with either one, but it's better than trying to, uh, you know, deal with more legitimate pilots. So they have a pretty good understanding of the criminal underworld, but they don't really know how to get our heroes in touch with Miata. So more investigation is required. Once we reach the investigation stage, that's when things start to get really dangerous. Of course, it would take the characters a little while to figure that out. So they start, based on the, the limited information they get from the rebels, they start paying attention to the local underworld and figuring out what stuff is Jabba's what stuff is independent operator and what stuff has to be going through Miata? They know that she doesn't deal in the things that Jabba deals in, generally speaking. So they're, they've got their eyes peeled and they're trying to make contact. They're trying to play up this, you know, uh, cast out of Jabba's good graces role, you know, and they're looking for the opportunity to change sides. Well, after a while, they're able to figure out maybe who some of the players are that are tied to Miata. And then they want to, you know, get in with them. Well, that just doesn't really work out anything like they planned. And then they get interrupted. They get interrupted by stumbling across a dead ringer for HK-85M, their former droid bounty hunter, except he doesn't seem to recognize them. And there's more than one of him. They are identical. There's three and then later four that they've seen. And they're staking out this, this central bazaar area. 
Well, they really need to operate in that bazaar if they're going to figure out who's who in the local underworld. But these droids are clearly trying to serve a bounty and they're waiting right there in the thick of things. So they, you know, they reconnoiter all of this and they, they make a surreptitious trip to the, the Bounties Hunters Guild to find out if HK-85M is actually operating here or some, someone or something just like them. And they discover that they are, that there's multiples of this Bounty Hunter all operating legitimately in this area. So they have to figure out how to deal with this, how to circumvent that, especially if you know these droids are looking for them. And they have some reason to believe that that might be true. They, they, they suspect that HK's memory has been wiped. But based on information that T3's been hoarding forever, uh, there's something about his construction which resets him to this bounty hunter personality and where they had initially picked him up was here in Tatooine. So their suspicion is that he's trying to fulfill the bounty offered by Jabba without even knowing who it is that he's hunting, doesn't realize that he was once a part of this crew. He's very dangerous. So they just want to avoid that particular situation. And they're in a hurry. They're on the clock. They know soon that the freighter bearing Rin and Wreck and all these hostages will be arriving. But they don't, of course, have specific times, which is why they need to hook up with Miata. So everything has just gotten harder. Now, in the background to all of this, we have the drama starting to play out of Henry trying to become the mentor to Tyra. Tyra was the leader of, you know, the, the gaggle of, of street gang kids that they rescued from Brist. She's force sensitive. She was probably the reason why the Imperial operatives, our form of, of inquisitors, were, were hunting the kids in the first place. So Henry wants to train her. She wants to be trained, but at the same time, she's used to being in charge. You know, she's a teenager. This is her first time away from her home planet. She's on an alien world surrounded by all the sorts of things she's dreamed about her whole life. And she doesn't really recognize how dangerous it is. And so the, the, the crew keep hemming her in and, and saying, no, you can't and don't do this and, and uh, that sort of stuff. And so uh, myself as Tyra, I've been a bit rebellious and Henry can't quite figure out why it is. She won't just do what he tells her to do. You know, it's like I said, you know, go meditate on the force. And she's out running around trying to buy stuff in the bazaar. So it's been kind of interesting. And there's been this dynamic in the group. I'm not really sure that they, that they realize yet where they want to protect her from harm and they isolate her from all the stuff that turns out to not be harmful. And then they take her with them into the things that turn out to be the most dangerous situations that we've ever encountered. It's really been kind of amusing. Um, and she's, she's up for the challenge. She's a survivor. And she's starting to find her niche in the group, both in the way that I, I've pictured her and how she would interact with people, but also in finding a way to bring the skills that she actually does have to bear on the problems of the group. So she's she's earning her place. And I feel that uh, this dynamic, which has been pretty out in the open, uh, the, you know, the, the, the push and pull between the authority figures and the rebellious teen, uh, this has added some interesting elements to play that uh, that I didn't expect to be that interesting. So, the group, through its usual machinations, gets involved in a bar brawl, and during the bar brawl, with, of course, Tyra being present and nearly getting killed, uh, but also managed to, managing to get her licks in and save others, uh, they hook up with operatives that owe allegiance to Miata. 
and they're not the, you know, they're not the sharpest tools in the drawer and Highwind and Moss are able to, to con them into arranging a meeting with Miata. But it's at this point that the group decides they need to split up. Highwind's going to go off with Tyra and because his head is not in the game. He's terribly, terribly worried about what's happening at Brist. He's very worried about his nemesis, his real authentic nemesis, uh, Solera Crescent. She was last reported kidnapped uh, by the rebels, but not a rebel cell that uh, he has any connection with, not one that he even really trusts. A rebellious rebel cell more along the lines of uh, a grassroots uprising that's only concerned with that one world. And he just can't focus on anything. He hasn't been himself. So he and Ty are going to go off and try and figure out if they can get some news about Brist while Moss and T3 and Enri push on and make contact with Miata. So we ran one session in Hangouts without Captain Highwind, and then I ran a separate session during that same period of time with Captain Highwind. So that was that was kind of interesting juggling the two time frames uh, between them. So we'll start with the the group session first. They were instructed to meet Miata's men at a secluded spot just outside the border of town. So they do that. They're picked up in this old rusty sail barge kind of speeder, and you know they're blindfolded. Uh, the the crew isn't either smart enough or they don't care enough about droids to bother, you know, blindfolding T3 in any way. They just pick her up with a magnet on the bottom of the barge and off they go. And they're they're backtracking there and they're they're doing lots of double backs and switchbacks and this sort of thing to confuse the trail. Uh, they're clearly taking Miata's secrecy very carefully, but we've mentioned that they're not the the smartest individuals, but they do have some sort of animal cunning, and they certainly follow through the instructions that they're given to the letter. So, you know, Moss and and Henry, if Henry weren't a force sensitive and and able to to deal with this using the force, they would have been completely lost, and any pursuit would have been identified and lost. So there's competence in these villains, but on the surface, it was also funny, you know, that they they picked up three people, blindfolded two of them, and let the other person just kind of record the way to where they were going. So we got a kick out of that. And Miata's meeting point, not her hideout, but the, you know, kind of a, an audience chamber at or one of many audience chambers, possibly, that she has set up as the wreck of this of this bulk freighter out in the sands. And so you know, they're they're dumped outside of it, and the speeder barge goes off, and they're left to their own devices to to do what it is that they want to do. So they they find their way inside, and it opens up into this large cargo bay, and everything's off kilter, and there's cables all across the floor. So it's really difficult for the droid. It seems that everything about this place is antithetical to droids. You know, everything that can be done or that, that needs someone to do it is seemingly being done by an organic, not by a droid. We see surprisingly few droids. But we see a lot of automation. You know, there are there are turrets uh, for defense and whatnot. And I'm not saying that there are no droids at all because they, they do find some battle capable droids uh, also. But, like I mentioned, it seems if it's possible to use uh, an organic living species for something, then Miata will. So they spend some time waiting for Miata to show up at this audience. And they recognize one of Rin's ships is off in a docking bay to the side, you know, in this huge chamber. Everything just, you know, like a few degrees off square. And they're aware that uh, some kind of device is trying to probe the droid uh, to, you know, to splice in or slice in and, and try and lift something from her. This, this attempt fails. And they recognize elements of former uh, servants of Jabba uh, and smugglers and whatnot. And of course, Rin's crew 
parts of his crew are here and they're drunk out of their minds and you know just they're they're waiting 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 for Rin to come back so the you know the genesis of an idea begins to form well then the meeting happens and when she comes out they were kind of surprised because instead of like Java appearing on some kind of some hover barge uh, or floating platform that, that kind of thing she is fully encased in this armored suit and if you have lords of Nalhada you can become aware of uh, of what kind of hut she is they refer to there as shell huts but uh, I've of course made my own changes to to suit the reality of our setting a lot of the printed material from from the EU and whatnot we use as hearsay and so sometimes there's a grain of truth in it and sometimes it's exactly right and sometimes it's just you know fanciful rumor which which makes it fun for for all of us so anyway so she appears fully armored and it's it's a, a really big scene you know using light and and size and scale and she's so much bigger than Java she doesn't waste any time she's you know right in their face do you have something to trade and she knows who they are but at the same time she's focused on the relationship what could they possibly do for each other so the negotiation goes pretty well Moss is very capable in those situations and there's a lot of humor too like do you have something to trade and uh Laura playing T3, the first thing that pops out of her mouth is, don't anybody look at me. <laughs> and uh, it was a, a very cool callback to, to Luke just saying, you know, here, have these two droids that have been following me around through these last two movies. But uh, that was pretty cool. And uh, I really wanted to, I really wanted Miata to feel differently from Jabba. This was a concern I had in the, in the beginning. Like, how am I going to portray her? can I get into the head of the species rather than the character that sort of thing so it was a fun scene for me to finally bring this character forward and have the the players and characters interact with her and at the end of the negotiation she had bought that you know that they wanted to leave Java and this is perfectly understandable from her point of view uh, but she assigned them a very particular task she wanted them to take this amount of explosives she provided it for them and to put it in Jabba's big entertainment sail barge so she had very specific instructions about where the explosives were supposed to go you know midships just above the the below decks bar area and she really wasn't going to take no for an answer if you want to work for me this is what you're going to have to do well the group agrees to do it I mean it's no skin off their nose and they can certainly warn Jabba later and and blah 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 so they, they're they're fine with this they take the explosives and while they're waiting for pickup they you know use their talents to try and pick up on rumors and and gossip that are that are circulating especially between all of these drunk former members of of Rin's band now Rin has been away from Tatooine and, and his group for ages and they have a, a, an idea that he had been captured by the Imperials but now he's out and and trying to make his way back in so you know do his men still trust him and are they in in regular communication that sort of thing so they're plying them with even more alcohol and trying to get them to talk well, while this is all going on, it's all very entertaining. Henry is starting to get a little impatient, I feel. And so we were having some discussions about the Force. And it was actually during these few sessions that he has earned uh, more conflict than at any previous point since we started tracking it. Since he you know, seriously started to, to take training. And so, you know, he's he's pushing and manipulating with with influence taking more and more control over the weak-minded and you know these are things I'm, I'm making note of and the other players are, are making note of like why is he doing this and, and assessing his motives which is an aspect of the rules that I find to be particularly interesting is that they are overt you know when when 
conflict is applied, everybody at the table knows that they know when the force sensitive character is struggling with something. It's, it's obvious, like it should be, like it is in the films. And so in addition to the internal conflict, that, that pressure within, you have the judgment of the others to, to give everything more weight. I really like this and I plan on having it be more of a feature in subsequent sessions, which I'm sure uh, Lawrence, who plays Henry, will both love and hate. Maybe mostly hate, but that's fine because it'll be the good kind of fun hate. <laughs> but anyway, they agree to do this and while they're waiting for the opportunity to, to be ferried away safely from her hideout, a message comes in from Rin and Rec to his former crew with the coordinates and the times and everything. It's exactly what they've been waiting for. But this freighter, you know, they're very worried with all the hostages and all the material that's on it of you know being stopped and boarded by the Imperials. So Rin is calling with this desperate message, you know, you've got to get us, you know, a legit passcode so we can just go past the blockade. And, you know, Moss uh, makes sure that, that he buys that, that they'll do that for him. Now, he thinks he's talking to his own crew. He's actually talking to, to Moss and he's talking to one of his engineers who's being controlled by Henry. And so this is pretty interesting. They contact Highwind, and this adds a task to Highwind's solo uh, session to get this passcode. And then they go on to Rin's ship and they steal it. And they're kind of hoping that none of this seems too bizarre or strange to Miata, but she demonstrates how it is she's managed to be a threat to Jabba and to avoid uh, any retribution. I mean, she's, her organization is clearly inferior to his, and yet, you know, how has she managed to be a threat? Well, she demonstrates some of that immediately. They lift off, they're about to leave the atmosphere, and she sends them a farewell message and activates a large explosive device, which had already been planted in Rin's ship, perhaps as a means of control. So there was some shock there, but then one heartbeat Later, the smaller explosive that they have, that they were supposed to plant on Jabba's sail barge, it also starts counting down. So we have this very cool session where T3 is trying to block incoming signals for, for detonation and also figure out how to stop the countdown. And Enri's trying to throw the, the more portable explosive out the airlock, which is when we meet our next major and intriguing NPC, the assassin. Now they had first encountered this character in Miata's audience chamber. And it was just a, a momentary scene where, you know, they, you know, they're very, very, very cautious and they don't like the surroundings. So they're, they're paying very careful attention to each step forward, you know, looking for sliding pits or, or anything along along those lines, which is, of course, very difficult to stand on or not stand on any kind of object that looks like a metal trap door if you're in the wreckage of a, you know, a space freighter. But anyway, with that little bit of added tension, you know, they approached the original audience with Miata. But as they were making their way forward, a character had appeared behind them and they, they don't know how this, you know, this cloaked and masked figure had, had gotten so close to them, close enough actually to pull back Henry's cloak and find his lightsaber and comment on it, clearly having revealed herself or itself. They discovered later that it's, it's female. So this character had already made a, a big impression, right? How, just how capable is this particular NPC and what is the character's role in things. So Henry and this character end up having a, a fight in the airlock dealing with this explosive. And so desperate is Henry to get the thing off the ship and this assassin 
is using a web thrower trying to connect him with <laughs> with the explosive. So, you know, if successful, he's going to have to throw himself off the ship um, with the explosive. So it's it's really tense, like a you know, the gloves are off kind of combat. So he draws the lightsaber, and as she's you know fleeing from this this weapon, he cuts her down. Not sure if he finishes her off or not, but you know then gets rid of the explosive. So this threat has been averted. He closes the airlock and he goes looking for her, only to discover that uh, she survived the blow. Strips her of her gear. There's not a lot of time. Uh, so, you know, binds her up in one of the storerooms and goes to deal with the other problems like the very large countdown to the, the bigger explosive device and are they going to try and, you know, crash land the ship? Are they going to evacuate? What are they going to do? So T3, because of her awesome prowess, manages to uh, defuse the countdown situation. We still have the, the bomb as some kind of threat. But they, they change their minds. They, they stop the landing process and they go back out and, uh, and head into, into space to make their rendezvous. So once all this is clear and everyone is sure that the ship isn't going to explode, they aren't going to become particulate matter in space, Henry goes to deal with the assassin to discover that she has escaped. So using his finely honed force senses and all of his concentration, he tracks her through the ship, and at a certain point, she surrenders. She recognizes that she's not going to be able to uh, evade him forever, particularly in such conf confined spaces. So she comes forward and surrenders, you know, handing over uh, her ritual dagger as a, as a sign of, you know, let's say, limited fealty. And they, of course, can see her in the light better now and recognize that she has been branded uh, with you know, Miata's symbol. And so she's, she's more than just you know, a hired gun. She is perhaps a slave or extremely loyal. They're not really sure. But what they do know is that for the length of this operation, whatever it is they're going to undertake, the assassin is not going to, to try anything else. And recognizing that she herself was going to be blown up by an explosive in Rin's ship didn't impress her very much either. So she's, she's quite happy to remain neutral. And again, using the force, Henry recognizes that he can trust her word. And so they set her up in quarters and they continue with their deceit of Rin and Wreck. Which brings us to what happened with Captain Highwind. So, Highwind and Tyra, they reconnect with the Rebels. And through a little bit of leverage, a little bit of negotiation, some, some promises, some charm, that sort of thing, Highwind gets from them as much as they know about the current status of things on Brist, which is only a little bit more, a little bit more behind the scenes information than was what than what was publicly available. But you know, the, the group had been in hyperspace through most of this and cut off from any of these official news reports until they hit port. But Tatooine is very, very, very far away from Brist on the other side of the galaxy. Actually, the, the system with Brist is in the neighborhood of the galaxy where you can find the Mandalorians, where you can find Yavin and, and all that sort of stuff. Close to hot borders and, and moving out toward the outer rim. So they have traveled clear across the galaxy and they are ahead of this small bit of news that the Empire may not want broadcast fully. Right, so what is happening there? And he's desperate to find out, you know, did the Rebel Alliance capture this very important uh, Imperial agent? And, you know, what was her fate? And what happened with, uh, what happened with the rebellion? Now, while this was the focal point of the session, the session actually began with 
Tyra, and Hywin making their way back from the edge of town, working their way through. And this is where we got to focus a little bit on, you know, the, the conditions on Tatooine for the group. This is Highwind operating on his own. He's the, the most famous. He's the face of the group. And if the bounty hunters are looking for anybody automatically, it's him. So he's trying to make his way back into town surreptitiously and reconnect with the rebels. And of course, this doesn't quite go as planned. So while they're making their way through the bazaar and taking the opportunity to try and get some, some discounts on some very important gear, well, they have two encounters. First is with the, the group of HK-85Ms, and second is, of course, with people who are actively looking for Highwind. Highwind and Tyra working together make pretty short work of this opposition. Not really so much in combat, although that happens as well. We have a, a quick draw in the street scene, which... Uh, will definitely go toward amping up Highwind's fame across the galaxy. But really it was their their use of terrain, their their stealth, and their willingness and ability to connect with you know the, the regular run of the mill people of Tatooine that enabled them to evade capture and detection and reconnect with the rebels. So I enjoyed that quite a bit. What could have been you know, a long-running battle through the streets of Tatooine, or what could have been a very painful and embarrassing capture, or you know, a, a separation of their forces, or and and spun off into a very long and complicated series of sessions. You know, they were very well able; they were adroitly able to to handle this threat and stay focused on what it was that they wanted to do, not get distracted by the opportunity for a little bit of gunplay or whatever, and uh, you know sidestep and avoid confrontation, which I think is the heart and soul of that smuggler career, and especially the way that Paul has played Captain Highwind throughout the campaign. So that was a very cool thing. So the first thing that Highwind manages to learn from the rebels is their speculation on why it is there have been such important fleet movements in and around Tatooine. Why are there always, you know, Star Destroyers, plural here and why it is there are periods when they get pulled away and the speculation that the, the rebel operative has for him is that some functionary inside the imperial military machine has been trying to build up forces at Tatooine in order to launch some kind of operation but something somewhere in the galaxy that can be accessed you know via the smugglers run or some other route from Tatooine has seen those forces drained away time and again and new forces are brought in to replace them and a buildup starts to happen and then they're drained away again and again. So from the perspective of the films, uh, when the Tantive Four comes hurtling into the screen above Tatooine, there, there's no Imperial presence here. But later on when uh, Luke and Han are trying to escape with, with Ben Kenobi, of course, that Imperial presence that was chasing Leia is still there. But then in subsequent movies, it has built up. We've seen even more of a presence there around this world that is not terribly important to either the story or the galaxy. So this is fit into our campaign in this way. Some governor or, or ranked individual within the Imperial Navy keeps trying to build up forces here and events conspire to see those forces drained away. But the rebel operative has no idea what reason for the buildup there could be. But maybe Highwind and his crew with this piece of information can suspect and figure that out for themselves. We'll see. So with this piece of information, this is what's well, really important to the rebel operative operating on Tatooine. But none of this really answers Highwind's question very much, except he recognizes maybe that the forces stripped away from Tatooine during the Eight Day Rebellion uh, were used to reinforce other elements of the Imperial Navy that had been pulled away to 
to go and respond to Brist. So he's starting to see some of the, the challenges that that routinely face the rebellion and how his tactical mind and training might be brought to bear to assist the rebellion. It's another temptation, another lure for Hywin to join the rebellion. But he has been watching this message. As they escaped from Brist on their way to Tatooine, he'd received a message from Solera Crescent, his former lover, uh, his nemesis, this high-ranking official in the Imperial Security Bureau. She's an intelligence agent extraordinaire. She is an agent provocateur. She has been behind a lot of their recent hardship, and yet he still has this soft spot for her. And this last message that she sent was kind of taunting, and there was something just not right about what she said to him, and it's been eating at him ever since. Finally, after watching it again and again, you know, sitting alone in his in his rooms, you know, reviewing this this last message from his his former lady love, he finally breaks her code and recognizes that she's sending him a coded message. She's telling him that he has to warn the rebellion to protect the rebellion. And what does that mean? So still digesting all of this information about Imperial naval movements down the smugglers run and at specific points of call across the galaxy, he's trying to impress upon this rebel cell the importance behind his finding out the whereabouts and condition of this captive, this very important rebel captive, this Imperial security agent, Solera Crescent on this very small world very very far away and is successful in communicating that that need but as of yet is still waiting for information to come back so it's around this time that he receives the message from Henry and Moss tasking him with getting this clearance code. Now, this is something that he could arrange to get from the rebels, or he could dip into his own black market contacts. Uh, but either way, he's going to have to move into Moss Eisley, which is even more dangerous than, the, than where he is right now. But never one to shirk from danger, Highwind and Tyra obtain transportation for themselves and make their way across the desert sands to that special hive of scum and villainy we've all grown to love so much, Moss Eisley. And while in a sense it seems like we're glossing over this whole session with Highwind and Tyra, a lot of things were accomplished. A, a good working relationship was developed between the two. Uh, they found a, a good point of connection between their different skill sets and a lot of background information that Tyra had been, you know, playing close to the vest was was coaxed out of her because of the the development of trust. You know, the time that that Paul as the player was taking with Highwind and Tyra to develop some kind of relationship with this uh, newly important NPC in the group. So I appreciated that a lot and the time taken to pull out all of this uh, information and make sure these these important threads were kept active such as what's going on uh, in the world we just left and is there some way to get information about these these characters we've we've bonded with and left behind in particular can anyone keep tabs on our enemy because she's been you know so important to the health and ongoing thrill of this campaign so all of that was great, but it wasn't just a whole lot of talking. There was a lot of threat in the form of the, the four HK-85Ms and in the bounty hunters and Jabba's goons that are all around them. And they're going now from the frying pan into the fire by heading into Moss Eisley. So there was a lot of bravery and, and cool stuff going on with a lot of fun banter between the two characters, which it's difficult to relay in this kind of recap. 
Well, there you have it. These two characters who have already been through an awful lot now have to make their way into the fire, into Moss Eisley, in order to get these passcodes and get them sent off to T3 Moss and Enri so that they can secure the freighter and deal with Wreck and Rin once and for all. And they handle this with aplomb, setting up the next scene. We had hoped to be able to arrange things so that everybody could be together for the session involving the freighter, but they didn't work out that way. So we had to run another session without Captain Highwind, but it was easy enough to explain. You know, the, the distances were too great for him to make a, a sudden appearance in the nick of time, as cool as that would have been. So what this means is that in the stolen ship, Rin's ship, they are approaching, you know, again, controlling the engineer character to be their, uh, their form of communication so that no one will suspect it's them. And they want to close with the freighter and board. Everything is normal. They communicate the code, which they got from Highwind. Everything should be great. But then the alarm bells start to go off. They're being guided to one specific hangar bay and there have been modifications made to the outside of it and it's a tractor beam which latches onto them and pulls them in and then it closes behind them and they recognize that they're looking at this portable missile battery which is designed for taking out uh, small vehicles but will certainly be a significant threat to this old freighter that they're in and you know somewhere along the way they start saying it's a trap uh, and the real excitement of this long series of adventures began. So our most recent session opens up with the ship closing on the freighter and you know they're, they're looking at it and failing to recognize some of the significant signs that things are not uh, what they seem, which enables this first stage of the trap to close around them so that the hidden tractor beam activates and starts pulling them in to the docking bay. So they're, you know, all senses are alert now. The ship lands inside the docking bay. The, the blast door is closed behind them. They know they've been sealed in. They recognize this missile launcher for what it is. This is the opening scene of the session. So everybody's ready for anything. They're not really sure uh, who is doing this. It doesn't seem like Rin and Wreck anymore. This is far too aggressive and far too capable for them. So what's going on? Uh, we thought we had a grip on it, but now we don't. It's like the rug has been pulled out from under them in this in this opening scene. So, you know, they, they, they see the missile launcher, uh, the door slide back, it's active, it's going to it's going to fire over in the corner where the the airlock is, the access point to this to this particular docking bay, they see armored, you know, power armored troopers come in and finally they get the hint that they're looking for because in this uh, the insignia on the the power armor is of a group of mercs that they absolutely humiliated back uh, a few sessions ago back in Vev station one of their regular ports of call and they you know they they trashed a ship they they wiped out a lot of their their green troops they they caused an awful lot of financial loss, which of course is of most importance to a mercenary company. So they recognize that they are persona non grata with these particular mercs, but how they got hooked up with Rin and Wreck is still a mystery, but at least it's an enemy they've faced before. So rather than hang around and be blown up, the group is trying to make its way out of the ship. Can they get out before uh, the missiles launch kind of thing? And just like the last time the group faced this particular band of mercenaries, the, the implied and visible threat in terms of gear and, and members, numbers, that this, this group showed pushed all of Henry's operational buttons. <laughs> so he just unleashes himself. Normally he's quite restrained in his use of the force or, or secretive about it so that you know observers can't report but the last time he faced this group and and this time the gloves came off so using force move he hurls the the missile launcher out of the way uh, so that it, it it crumples up against the wall some of the missiles fire and they're they're a, a hazard inside the docking bay but the group is fine the ship is fine 
and they make their way out of the ship and the the armored troops are pouring in they're not really sure how many of them there there are and how many are waiting out in the hallway but without really waiting for any more of a sign Henry continues dipping down into the force and for once allowing himself to to give in to his anger and rather than staying as as he has been as a seer cool and collected and allowing the force to act through him he dips into his anger and he he channels power from the dark side which enables him to lift up their YT 1300 piece of crap freighter and flip it into the doorway sealing off the enemy troops on the other side and of course killing those who had just come through the door there is a moment of kind of odd silence as this happens and then the group gets underway again and they're looking for another way out so t3 is able to secure a way down to a lower docking bay and once they arrive in there they they see that this is where the mercenaries ship is and they're surrounded by all this you know all these cargo crates that they expected to be up in the the previous docking bay so this is where the the push to be quick and be agile starts to break down as the group gets caught up discussing what they want to do next which allows the mercs to recover from the shock of what just happened upstairs and you know a gunner goes up into the turret of the the merc ship and starts to hose down this docking bay so using the uh, area of effect blast rules we nearly wiped out the entire group but thanks to cover and armor and quick thinking and all of the stuff the the group survives this narrow miss with you know planetary scale weaponry and they charge and invade the mercenary ship and now Henry's in full battle mode the lightsaber is out and he's not scrupling to avoid use of the dark side he uses every point he can get his hands on in order to take this ship down as fast as he can backed up by the very injured moss and t3 and they do so fortunately the ship was only guarded by a very small rear guard and t3 is able to you know, lock down this dock and give themselves some breathing room while they're there they avail themselves of the finely stocked uh, medical supplies that the mercs have and very quickly get themselves in motion to move against Rin and Rec wherever they must be using T3 as their eyes they start scanning through the ship and they have two main routes they can travel they can go up through the skin of the ship which will take a lot longer but help them avoid any merc patrols that are are in the, the living areas of the ship or they could take an even riskier approach by going up one main central elevator which they would expect to be booby trapped and it's this that they decide to do which means they they bypassed hooking up with a lot of cool NPCs uh, the the street kids had formed their own little rebellious gang and were turning the ship against the mercs which is part of what enabled uh, this invasion to be successful at all the, the mercs had had a long time to prepare but then ended up fighting the ship itself as these young and talented uh, street kids and, and outlaw techs uh, were messing with everything. So we, we missed the opportunity to have a, a reunion uh, between the PCs and these NPCs, but at the same time, this allowed us to have a very fast paced adventure. So rather than just board the elevator, uh, they, they get on top of the elevator and and they make a stealthy approach up and in time to interrupt the the two villains Rin and Rec having a an alliance breaking argument with the Merc commander and while these three are kind of monologuing at each other uh, Moss and Henry and T3 burst in and are able to make very quick work of them but not without some treachery they discover that Lynn Delmar is there she's there as a hostage she's she's uh, bound to a chair she's and you know they've got 
weapons on her. They will kill her if the group doesn't comply, but they don't, they haven't reckoned with just how upset they've made everybody. And so Henry is able to take down the Merc commander and working together, they're able to take, to get Rin and Rek to surrender because these are not frontline fighters by any stretch of the imagination mostly through the intimidating use of grenades. But once they have surrendered and they're trying to free Lin, Rin proves his dastardly nature by trying to use a holdout blaster to, to take her out. Fortunately, from a certain point of view, he hits Henry instead and, uh, and doesn't get the, this killing blow on a helpless Lin. He gets it on a more active and heavily armored character instead who again has to deal with the dark side. Now he's been, he's been dipping into the dark side freely for this whole scenario. And now he's faced with this absolute treachery from this person they know they can't trust. And will he be able to step away from his anger and rage? And this was a, a pretty dramatic scene. And it was decided that the character would step away from it. And we left it in the player's hands. How did he want to deal with this? Did he want to have all the momentum he's built up through the entire campaign count for something? Or did he want this to be a, you know, a, a pivotal or turning point in the character where he was beginning to crack under the strain? And uh, he opted to have this this long running behavioral, behavioral momentum of, of not giving in to his dark impulses matter. This character is firmly grounded on the light side of the force. And this was our opportunity to demonstrate that for real. So this is where the session concluded. We had a a hug and a kiss reunion between Henry and Lynn, which was cool to see. This was the first overt signs of their relationship in the entire campaign. And we are in a position now to start uncovering some of the deeper secrets. How did Rin and Rec get in the right place at the right time? How were they connected to this very well-funded mercenary force? What was the whole point of this? And they received information through the talents of T3, that once again, this all ties back into the CSA, to Lynn's father and her uncle, and their attempts at a large scale takeover of certain planetary systems, all tied together with the, the mining and selling of Cortosis, connections to Jabba the Hutt, and on and on it goes. They haven't uncovered the exact whys and wherefores about why it's so important to uh, Lynn Delmar's father that she be killed, but we're one step closer to uncovering that piece of mystery that has been following us through almost the entirety of this campaign. And so that gets us up to date. I don't know how long it'll be before the next recap, but hopefully not so long as this.